Thank you out there for joining uh, Creed Strategies for our Creed Speaks series. Um, these discussions were started, you know, as a part of our way of staying connected to the community and the world around us during the pandemic. Um, and we've just been really uh, grateful and fortunate to be able to connect with people in the county, in the city, and across the nation around things that are really important to Newark as a community, to the city and the state and the county um, as issues. And so this evening, we have with us um, four women who probably need no introduction to those of you who are watching um, and whose bios are fantastically filled with amazing accomplishments um, and are really a testament to the work that in the various stages of their careers that they have done and the contributions that they are making um, to our city, to our state and to the nation as a whole. And so I will begin, um, and I have the good fortune of being able to do this in alphabetical order, but with a woman who um, we, we bow down to and who we stand on um, the shoulders of Dr. Joyce Wilson Harley Esquire. Um, she is truly a giant um, and has done so much uh, just to pave the way uh, for I think all of us, even in the different spaces that we occupy. Um, and so Dr. Harley is an attorney who specializes in community development, economic development, and public policy initiatives. She is the owner of Operation Big Vote, which demonstrates her commitment to moving the voting process and engaging women of color and people of color in the voting process. She is a history maker. She is the first black person elected to the South Orange City Council. Uh, and served uh, as the first black woman in the county administrator for Essex County. So she is, she is a woman of first and I doubt, and I'm sure that there are many, many more to come. Uh, she is the past president of the Association of Black Women Lawyers in New Jersey and the past president of the Montclair alumni chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Uh, so if any of her sorors are out there listening, Dr. Harley is representing you well this evening. Uh, she's the chair of the Political Action Committee for the NAACP of the Oranges and Maplewood. Um, and she is a published author. She is an attorney, educator, political activist. She has been called on by mayors, governors, political organizations to lend her wisdom and her exp expertise um, to their work as well. We are also joined this evening by Councilwoman LaMonica McIver, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting many years ago for the first time over dinner. I don't even know if you remember. I just remember that recently. Um, and I was impressed with her then. She is a compassionate leader and a committed public servant. Um, she is born and raised in the Central Ward of Newark. Uh, she's a public educator. She's a mom of a beautiful, vibrant, active young girl, little girl. Um, she spent her life working in the community and is dedicated to public service. She's a founder of Newark Gals, Inc. and a founding trustee of the Believe in Newark Foundation. Uh, she grew up in New Hope Village. Um, she has a passion to inspire and help people within her, with her community. She started working in politics at the age of 10, organizing youth groups to encourage others on the importance of getting out to vote. Um, after graduating with an English degree from Bloomfield College and a master's degree in educational leadership and policy from Seton Hall, she started her career as a school leader, educator, and HR professional in a number of public school districts. In 2018, Councilwoman LaMonica McIver was elected um, to the Newark Municipal Council as the Central Council Ward member. She is the youngest woman and council member to serve on the Newark Municipal Council. Thank you for joining us this evening. Sarah Pena was born and raised and educated in Newark. She received her bachelor's degree in management from Keene University 
and her master's degree in public administration from Rutgers Newark University in Newark. Ms. Pena recently served as the biden harris policy volunteer on the Education Committee. In 2018, Sarah served on Governor Phil Murphy and Lieutenant, she Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver's Human and Children's Services Transition Advisory Committee. She's a current member on the Advisory Council for the New Jersey League of Women Voters, and their mission is empowering women voters and defending democracy. She has served in the capacity as president for three years of Lupe, Latinas United for Political Empowerment, which is a statewide bipartisan organization to empower, educate, and engage women from all walks of life through leadership, advocacy, and education to benefit all communities and to elevate the status of women. Newark Mayor Raz J. Baraka appointed Ms. Pena in 2019 to the city's commission on the status of women. Um, where she serves as an ambassador um, and policy advisor, policy maker for women's issues, advocates for community outreach and advisors to the mayor on city issues. She's inspired by her son, Anthony, mm -hmm. um, and founded the Boys to Leaders Foundation in 2013. Its mission is to empower and motivate young men by providing leadership training, education of programs, and positive personal and professional development. She is a graduate of the Leadership Newark program. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us this evening. And we have with us this evening Deputy Mayor of Community Engagement, Jacqueline Quiles. Um, Deputy Mayor Quiles is, in, is a Newark native. She has been a social worker and held numerous senior positions in the Latino community. She's an activist. Um, she's been involved in social organizations, including serving as the president of the, this is where you need your reading. Glasses. Puerto Rican statewide parade. <laughs> oh, that's not what it says, but that's, yes. Say it in Espanol, por favor. Um, Define estatal puertorriqueño. Ah, gracias. Puerto Rican the Puerto Rican Spanish Parade <laughs> of New Jersey for six years. For her work, she has received numerous commendations from New Jersey and Puerto Rican organizations and political leaders. Deputy Mayor Quiles' parents, Anderson and Ada Quiles, are of Puerto Rican descent. Deputy Mayor Quiles attended TBI, earning a certificate in business administration in 1992 and she competed and won the title of Miss Puerto Rico in the state of New Jersey. So we can be brilliant and beautiful <laughs> at the same time. Uh, Deputy Mayor Quiles has had several positions in the Puerto Rican statewide parade, including pageant coordinator, delegate, and public relations chief. In 2006, she became the youngest president of the Puerto Rican parade for the state of New Jersey. As a part of uh, the Puerto Rican parade, Deputy Marquiles was asked by Cablevision to broadcast the annual parade statewide in Spanish with her own scripts. And I welcome Deputy Marquiles to this panel. And I thank also the women who have connected me with some of the women on the panel. Um, I wanna thank Ty Cooper. I wanna thank Linda Baraka for um, just building my network um, and giving me the opportunity to meet such um, accomplished, committed, and powerful women um, and to grow from knowing with you. So I would like to start with our first question for the evening. Um, and that question is, what has shaped your evolution as a woman of color in politics? Um, and given that I can't go in alphabetical order anymore because Dr. Harley is, um, is, is taking a, a pause. Um, wow, I'm having technical difficulties. Oh, you are? Well, okay. Yes, that's okay. I'm coming back in. Okay, just, that's, but you can take your pause. We get it. It's, you know, it's technology glitches everywhere. Um, I think I'd like to ask uh, Sarah if she would like to uh, go ahead and start. What a great question and what a great way to start, Lauren. Thank you. And I'm honored to be among some of the top leaders that I know and love, love each and every one of you and the work that you do. Um, what has shaped my evolution as a woman of color in politics? There's, it was nothing I read in a book. It wasn't anything somebody told me or just one experience. I think it's been the manifestation of a set of experiences in my life. Um, we women of color are always called upon 
for all kinds of help and to set up or do things. And many times we're not being asked to run for office or being supported on some of the issues that are important. And so watching that happen in my experiences through in politics is what kind of shaped my evolution, being involved in uh, being involved in organizations that were 501c4s, uh, leading a 501c3 statewide, involved in political action committees, it kind of gave us, gave me and many of my other sisters, black and brown sisters, the opportunity to kind of get into the grassroots and lobbying, where we can kind of own our independent political power and really stand grounded on the issues that are important. So I think all of that in its entirety has shaped my evolution as a woman of color in politics. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilwoman. Oh yes, thank you, Dr. Wells. Thank you for the um, amazing question. So I think for me, I mean, starting as a youngster, shall I say, it feels like it was 50 years ago. <laughs> um, it, it's been a long time. I think the number one thing for me, um, you know, getting into politics, but keeping me involved in politics was just the love of the people. Um, and I say that I know all the time, it's not always easy, you know, but um, at the end of the day, I, you know, saw the impact, you know, of the work that I was doing on people. Um, and that kind of kept me going. Like, I, you know, I kind of use um, the people that I serve, you know, no matter what the capacity is, rather it's via, you know, my nonprofit or my work in politics, just to kind of keep me pushing. To me, I feel like that, you know, well rounds me um, and everything that I'm becoming, everything that I've become um, through the people that I'm working for. Like I said, rather it's young girls, um, you know, or, you know, residents or whatever I'm working on at the time, the, the impact of what I'm doing for the people definitely has, you know, created me into, into what I am now, you know, and over the time. That sounds that a little cliche a little bit, but. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I don't think it sounds, I think it's what I heard from you and Sarah is that being, seeing absence and seeing how the spaces weren't there, but also being on the ground um, and being close to people is what, you know, was part of how you have seen yourself and your work in this space evolve. Deputy Mayor, what about you? Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be in this panel with everyone. I'm so impressed with the resume. And I just want to share my evolution as a woman of color has been really influenced by strong women that came before me. There are many doors that are not fully open to women of color, and there is need of a representation. Our community deserves a voice, a platform, which to advocate for our needs. And I thank the many women that came before me. And I also wanna to continue to open that door and hopefully um, help the new generation. I also think that my strong relationship with my mother okay. is also a great factor of who I am today. Thank you. Thank Dr. You. Harley. Thank you again, Dr. Wells, for putting this panel together. As I said, there was never a better time and a greater time when this kind of conversation needed to be had. I happen to have been, um, I've lived long enough to have been an eyewitness to history. And this was my very, what I'm going to describe was my very first involvement in, um, in politics. My grandfather was a Baptist minister in a little small town in Georgia called Rail, Georgia. He was a very, very big supporter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, he invited his entire congregation and all of his grandchildren who could walk to participate in that march from mm -hmm. Selma to Montgomery. So I was an eyewitness to history. And my brother and I, we were very young, but we were there for part of the march because it started out very um, positive and upbeat and everybody together, but the closer we got, the more um, hatred we saw, the more um, we were called names because we lived in New Jersey. We had not experienced what some of our cousins had experienced. And I, I bring that up because that was when my eyes were opened about the power of organized coalitions of groups. And there were lots and lots of black women who organized that march, including my mother, to whom I was very close, she's passed away. 
And I saw what can happen when people put their minds and their resources and their times and their talent together to make change. And of course the march was, you know, it, the first march was very unsuccessful. That's when I met John Lewis as a child. Uh, he was a teenager, it seemed to me at the time. He was beaten bloody. My grandfather was beaten. But at the end of the day, I saw the kind of success that happens when you know that you're doing the right thing and you're fighting for justice. And the only regret that I had, because that was a march for voting rights and we're still fighting for voting rights. Look at HR1 and how it's struggling to get through the Congress. But what I saw that day and what was inculcated into me was that we can make a difference. We do make a difference. And the only regret that I have is that my grandfather never lived long enough to see me get elected in South Orange. So that was the catalyst for me. And I've been engaged and involved ever since and encouraged by my parents, encouraged by the people around me to just never, ever give up. If you believe that what you're doing is right and you believe in justice, you believe in liberty, you believe in equality, keep going no matter what. Thank you. So uh, Councilwoman, I have an, a non-protocol question that Dr. Harley inspired for me to ask you. As the youngest council person, I'm, I'm curious, what was the catalyst for you to run for office at this phase of your life and, and your career? So, it was a few things, but the number one uh, most important um, reason that got me like to the finish line was one that, you know, I, I took a look around and there, you know, seriously were not a lot of young people that have, you know, ran for office. Um, been successful and then yet to be a woman doing it. Um, I mean, I thought about all of the people, honestly, all of the women that would be coming behind me that, you know, I, I pray every day that I'm inspiring um, young women and, and young, younger people in general, but um, specifically young women um, to want to be in politics, you know, to make politics, you know, look cool, you know, look fun, still be able to, you know, do all the things that we love to do as, as young people. But at the same time, you know, be cool enough to care about your community, right? Be care, be be um, cool enough to care about what's going on in your communities and be involved and be engaged. And so that's the number one reason why I ran, you know, for office. Just thinking about all of those. Um, this is that that um, spunky four year old that's <laughs> patting me on my <laughs> shoulder right now. Yeah, that's that's the hand. Give me one second, Zaya. But, you know, just to, just to do it for them, you know, and, and to, you know, lead the way and open up other doors and opportunities. So that's the number one reason, you know, for, for, for me doing this, you know. And Deputy Mayor, what encouraged you to take, to assume the position in City Hall? Well, um, it's funny because my friend called me and told me that they needed a new deputy mayor. So I tweeted the mayor and I told him, I'm your new deputy mayor. <laughs> I had a <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I was determined. You know, I visualized this position 10 years ago when I was doing the Puerto Rican parade. And I told my friend, one day I'm going to be the deputy mayor of the city. And she told me, it's a saying in Spanish, tu siempre soñando con pajaritos preñao, which I don't think it makes sense in English, which means you're always thinking of, of pregnant birds. Mm. But it, it means that you would never get there. And um, it's funny because when I first got the position, the first person that I called, it was her. And I told her, do you remember the day that I told you 10 years ago that I was going to be the deputy mayor of the city? She told me yes. And I told her, you're talking mm. to the deputy mayor of the city of Newark. So... <laughs> Uh, it was, That's great. I always tell the kids that in school. And um, I just wanted this position for many years. And I saw myself doing this uh -huh. job. And now that I'm doing it, I love it. And I just continue to push the city forward with the mayor. So Sarah, in the way that Jackie, dis I'm sorry, I just got real informal. <laughs> Went from deputy mayor to Jackie, but you know. <laughs> in the way that um, the deputy mayor uh, just described envisioning herself in a particular place. Have you had an experience like that in the evolution of your career? Absolutely. I had a vision like that early on as a little girl. Um, 
in Newark seeing some challenges, um, which today they tell me are traumatic experiences, right? Um, that we as women live in and sitting outside at night by myself in front of a church and thinking, God, I know there's a reason. I know there's a purpose for me, but I'm gonna be the best leader that Newark, New Jersey has. But I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna do it because whoever's coming behind me needs to know that this does not need to happen to them. So I'm gonna do, you guide me, Lord, and you tell me what I gotta do, and you put the right people in my path, Lord. And that's what I did it on faith. And I always believed in my community. I believe in the people in the community because there are great people there that do a lot of great things. And it's just like, um, I just always felt like I have to set the example because I don't want the same things that are happening to me to happen to the young people behind me. So I, that always kept me moving, just visualizing that I would be a leader, but I didn't know how or in what role. And I still keep dreaming big. I never stop dreaming. I always dream big. So before we um, went live, uh, Dr. Harley was um, just kind of reflecting on how now is the time and women of color are, are seizing the time. And I'm curious, Dr. Harley, for you to, um, and then anyone else who wants to jump in to really kind of talk to us about the call that Sarah just described, right? The call to lead, um, the call to step into the space where we need change and how you think that is a force in the work that women of color do um, and how you think it may make our work a little bit different than the way others approach it. Well, I think that, um, and uh, Sarah hit the nail on the head when she talked about a call, like an epiphany. When something or someone enters your life that lets you know that your steps are about to be ordered. And for me, it was being a junior at uh, Douglas College, which was at that time the female undergraduate division of Rutgers. And I met a woman by the name of Dr. Sylvia Drew. And I was taken with her. She was an attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. She came to Douglas College as a visiting professor to teach a course in constitutional law. And she was the first black woman that I'd ever met who was an attorney. And I looked at her and the things she was working on and the issues she were addressing were reminiscent of what I'd seen from my march from Selma to Montgomery and the work we were doing on campus at the time when civil rights was, was and, and the, the anti-war movement was going on. And I decided that, you know, I want to do that. I want to make a difference. I want to make, make, make things change for the better for my community. And so when you see that and you have that kind of calling because of your experiences and the things that you are, we didn't use the word woke then, but you're woke mm -hmm. and you can't stop. It's, it's a compulsion to make sure that you make a difference to make sure that you stand your ground, no matter what's going on around you, and to continue to march on and to move forward and to be, you know, to make a difference. And so those kinds of experiences wake you up mm -hmm. and you have no choice. It really is a compulsion. You can't do anything else. And you may get sidetracked a little. I had a career in finance and banking, mm -hmm. But I understood that a lot of what was happening to the community I cared about happened because of lack of access to capital, lack of knowledge of finance. But my steps were, were ordered. Understand finance, understand how this system, um, because I worked for Citibank for many, many years of private clients, understand how wealth is built and then take that knowledge and apply it to the community that you, you serve. So you may be working in a corporation, but you're also a Delta, or you're also a Link, or you're also involved with the National, Co National Council of Negro Women. So bring that information to your community and school people and get them, and get them ready. So that is why it may be different for, for black and brown women than it is for, for other women. And I don't know, because I'm not another woman, but that epiphany, and it strikes you like a lightning bolt, and you go, yep, steps are ordered. 
Thank you. I, I understand that from my, my work. I've tried to deviate from it a lot of times because mm -hmm. it gets, you know, it's, it, it, you're in the trenches and it gets and may I add a more challenging, emotionally challenging, right? And you, you, you try to, to move, but you just get pulled back into where you're supposed to be. So I, I really- and May I add just one more thing about mm -hmm. Dr. Sylvia Drew. She was the granddaughter, great granddaughter, of a Charles. granddaughter of Dr. Charles Drew. And when she told us the story of her grandfather inventing, discovering blood plasma, which mm -hmm. saved thousands upon thousands of lives. And guess why he died? Because he was a black man who could not be admitted to a hospital. So he died from lack of blood plasma. And that really showed me that there were things that needed to be corrected in our system. So, um esteemed panelists, what other um, women have influenced or paved the way for you? Dr. Harley talks about Dr. Drew and how have they done it? I think the concreteness of, of how we m open doors and make way for others um, is, is important to hear in our experiences. And um, Deputy Mayor. Well, for me, it was two women, two mayors. The first one was Felisa Rincón de Gautier. She was the first mayor of the capital of Puerto Rico. And she created many programs for students. She fought for women's rights and she was respected to the end of her years. She was a woman known by integrity, honesty, and I wish to be remembered just like her. And also another mayor, which I love is Mayor Diaz. Me and her, we worked many years together. She was a third, uh, three-term mayor, and I witnessed firsthand her many struggles, her mm -hmm. battles, but also her, all her success. And I was part of that campaign from the beginning to the end. And she's also a person that inflected me into politics. So those two women, mm -hmm. Elisa Rincón de Gautier and Mayor Diaz. I, I like that you said I, I wanted to be just like her. Yeah. I, I was, I was remember, yeah, remember. remember like her. I was, I was uh, recently writing something about um, teachers that I encountered my first year teaching and thinking about how much when I watched them teach, how much I wanted to be like them. And I think that sort of emotional impact that people have on us is, is really important. Sarah, who has impacted, paved the way for you and how have they done it? I would say it's it's um, Mildred Council President Mildred Crum, um, someone who believed in me, who saw something in me, and took me under her wing for many many years. Um, women like Denise Cook in Newark, um, Diane Hill, those trailblazers that that in Newark in the politics. Mary Cruz. I mean, I work with a lot of these women now on the Commission on the Status of Women, so I love it, but. Um, Councilwoman Mildred Crump really saw my passion and saw how hard I wanted to get involved. And nobody would open that door for me. Mm -hmm. Nobody would. And she said, oh, no, no, no. You come over here because I'm going to show you how, how we do it, how we women stick together. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot from the seasoned women of, of the great city that I love who taught me how to navigate you know, those rooms and get things done. So it, it's women like that that really paved the way for me. Thank you. And thank you for speaking Councilwoman's name into this space because she's, I think, you know, made her mark on a lot of us. Councilwoman McIver. Um, so I, I actually was going to say Councilwoman Crump as well. <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly, I mean, one of the reasons I started Nord Gals was just because you know, had it not been for a lot of women that I met around, you know, throughout my journey, I would not be here today. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I'm talking about women, you know, that I just, you know, met in the, in the workforce of Newark Public Schools of, um, you know, being an intern and just having like, you know, a, you know, average, wonderful, amazing woman tell you like the right ways to do things, give you the, the, the life skills, the necessary life skills that you need as a young girl that you don't necessarily get. A lot of young girls don't get all the time if they don't have that at home for them. So, you know, there were a lot of women that paved the way, but a, but a few for me has been, one is uh, Elizabeth Taylor at Newark Public Schools. I, mean, I don't know if she's watching or not, but she definitely, you know, was, the, was that woman that met me 
me at 14 and just had to check me all up, you know, oh no, this is what you do when you go into a room. This is how you do this, you know, oh, scratch that attitude. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares about that. Um, you know, just checking me along the way. Um, definitely my um, old math teacher, um, Terry Cooper, who is the vice principal now at Central High School. Definitely when I saw her, she was cool, young, you know, fly, had everything that us young girls wanted but at the same time she was the teacher making a difference and to see her that made us want to do something right in high school as a young girl in central you saw a young woman a young woman you know being and doing and successful I wanted to do that which you know pushed me to want to do something with my life and so definitely her and and then moving along into the community, I mean, I had the opportunity to have the, you know, shadowing of Miss Carolyn Wallace, Amina Baraka, mm -hmm. um, Mildred Crump, all of those women that dropped gems on me, you know, constantly over and over. Um, you know, definitely, I'm, I was blessed to be in that circle. And and now Mildred Crump, to be able to work with her every day, you know, to get that, those gems, to get that history, everything that um, Miss um, Sarah talked about, like, that is like, I mean, uh, it's like I feel so blessed and I always tell her every day like I really thank God for you because like literally I get firsthand dibs like like the young people say dibs on all of this you know historical um, you know leadership skills I mean being the first woman elected to the municipal council the first African-American woman I mean that's not an easy task talk about you know breaking glass ceilings I mean to be able to be right hand with her um, you know uh, throughout everything is definitely been you know amazing for me and, and just like um Sarah said she did the same thing with me when 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 I said I was running for council I mean I must have went to a thousand and one places to meet like a thousand and one women you know women all over and I, I mean it was every night we were going to like midnight every night just meeting um wonderful women and amazing women all over folks that I didn't didn't even know you know that I'm still connected to today so you know definitely shout out to a uh, councilwoman um Mildred crumb because she's definitely amazing and definitely represents that you know womanhood and sisterhood that we need to have more of um in the world in general but especially in politics and so she, before she's I... my soror you know she's yes. my soror and she has been an icon in delta sigma theta sorority forever and her reach is throughout essex county throughout the state she's been such a good friend and such a stand-up friend I mean, if your back's against the wall, there's nobody better to have in your corner than Council President Mildred Crump, my soror. So when I, um, <laughs> when I first started my work with the schools in Newark, I was giving a presentation. And I think I've said this before in public spaces, and it was for the, the Newark Alliance. And Councilwoman Crump was there and I had never met her before. I mean, I was really just trying to figure out how to navigate the work I was doing. And after the presentation, she came up to me. Uh, yes, I did tell, because I, I had told this story to her and my mom at the same time. Um, she came up to me and she pulled me aside and she said, how do you spell get? And I said, G-E-T. And she said, well, say it like that. It's not get. <laughs> That's so Mildred. Right. That is so Mildred. <laughs> because I was talking so fast and just talking, you know, so personally, personably in the way that I talked that I wasn't enunciating. And when that happened, I, I was so, I was, I was grateful, right? Mm -hmm. And so my question to you all now is about receiving feedback when we as sisters um, do are caring about the success of each other, and we do pull each other's coattails um, in the way that the councilwoman pulled mine, you know, as an elder in the community who saw a younger woman doing good work, and she wanted to make sure that when I was in public spaces, such as the Newark Alliance, that I was seen in my best light. Can you just talk a little bit about receiving feedback, even when it's really personally challenging and harsh, and how you, um, how you did that and how you've navigated that in your careers? Well, um, I had a, a moment similar to yours, uh, Dr. Wells, when um, I was a second year law student now, and I was sending out resumes all over. I had great grades, the whole nine yards. And I was getting interviews, but no job offers for summer associate positions. 
So I was living in East Orange at the time, and we had had our first Black mayor, Bill Hart. And so I decided that, because um, I'd heard that they were looking for summer associates, so I decided to go to City Hall and um, introduce myself and let them know that I lived in town, I voted for him, and I was looking for a summer associate job. And I met a woman by the name of Mrs. Goldie Burbage. She was the um, executive assistant to Mayor Hart. And she is, everybody and, and a lot of people know her. She is one of the classiest women you'll ever meet. And I show up and she, I told her, she said, well, how can I help you? Very polite. And I told her that I was wanted to talk to the mayor because I was looking for a job. She said, well, do you have an appointment? I said, no. She said, so you just walk into the mayor's office expecting to see him? I said, well, I voted for him. She said, so did 10,000 other people. Um, she said, what do you want? So I explained and she looked at me and she said, and you are hoping to be an attorney? <laughs> I said, yes. She said, well, if you're looking for a job as an attorney, you ought to dress and look like one. And she said, but I will give you an appointment with the mayor. She said, but you need to come professionally dressed and do all the right things that you do to show respect for his office. And I received that so well, because when I showed up the next time I had a suit on, I even had a briefcase, I had my documentation and I sat down because she got me that appointment. Because she saw something. Mm -hmm. She saw someone who was ambitious, who just did not know the way. And she has done that for so many other women that I know. And I just, and she's very active in East Orange and she was very active in the county. She was also the executive assistant to Dr. Yamba at Essex County College. She's just got a wonderful career, a wonderful spirit. And she is a class act. So when she tells you, you need to do something a certain way, mm -hmm. heed her advice, you can't go wrong. And I was hurt when I left, I was crushed. I don't look right, I'm not doing things right. But I listened to everything she said, and guess what? I got a summer associate job in the city of East Orange with Mayor Hart. I feel you. I was like, I can't speak. <laughs> I was like, oh, I have a speech problem. <laughs> uh, Councilwoman, do you have a, a, any thoughts about receiving feedback when it's given to you, and and just you know how to how to not take it so personally, and how to be present enough to allow yourself to receive it so that you can move forward. So it's so funny that you tell the story about a uh, council president <laughs> about the get um, story because she still does that <laughs> to this day. Um, <laughs> so she she's definitely famous for that. I think like, you know, she is like the closest, of course, woman that I'm working to on a daily basis. So she has literally, um, you know, a, check me on a few things like, you know, you know, do this or do that, or, you know, you shouldn't approach this this way. I mean, this politics stuff, right. It is um, definitely interesting and it's a daily <laughs> learning pattern um, of certain things, but I, I think she's definitely done that. I mean, I would love to have more of it. You know, I mean, I know a lot of women, I mean, every, every woman is not, you know, open to, you know, getting checked. I mean, it's not something that's like an opening door, like, come on in, tell me, about, you know, what I'm not doing right. I mean, it's not received well. I think that most, you know, women definitely see it as an insult versus them seeing it as an opposite, right? Um, and I, once again, it depends on what the check-in is about too. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I mean, I would definitely invite, you know, more of it, you know, especially for women who are in leadership too, you know, who are, you know, have already been here, you know, kind of done that kind of thing, but able to drop some gems and some advice to you because it's, it's important in, you know, right? It only helps you become better and we're all a work in progress. And so definitely, you know, I'm, I'm open to it and I have to try to do more of that myself too for, for, for women, right? So while we're someone's, you know, checking us and, you know, giving us some, you know, feedback, shall I say, I need to be mindful of that too. Sometimes I'm skeptical of even saying, to, you know, saying to someone like, look, maybe you shouldn't do that, you know, mm -hmm. to another woman, this might not be the right approach. But you don't want to offend, you know, you know, certain women because, you know, everyone, once again, is just not open to it. So I'm just like, let me just mind my business, you know, and not, um, you know, kind of upset anybody. But I think, you know, I would invite it and I should be doing more of it as well because it's helpful um, regardless of how it's received. But it's also all in a tone too, right? How we uh, deliver it. So 
definitely um I'm getting that get thing every day um, from <laughs> literally, literally every day I'm spelling out words and, yeah. and making sure I'm pronouncing, pronouncing them right. So definitely firsthand here. But you know, for me, I just, I, I was stunned and not in a bad way, right? I was just like, wow, <laughs> this woman that I'd never met before, like ever, like cared enough to say that to me. Yeah. And that, that meant something. Um, and as a new person in the city, it also showed me something about the city and about how people will, um, will connect with you, right? To help you, to help you be successful. So, you know, I, I, I think it's necessary and, you know, and it's also just, it's a funny story. It makes me it, it hard not to laugh. Jackie or Sarah, do you want to weigh in on this? Are you ready for I me? To I, I just want to say that um, I always get criticized because of my accent. And, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> and I, I, I get embarrassed sometimes because, you know, I've been here all my life and I still have an accent. And um, one day we do this great event. It's called Latina Empowerment Brunch. We do it every year. We didn't do it last year because of the pandemic. Hopefully we could do it this year at the end. And um, Mayor Baraka came to the speaker. And I, you know, I bring different women um, to em empower the girls. And he said, oh, you know, always be yourself. Don't be embarrassed of your accent. Maybe you got hired because of your accent. And you know that I was, you know, I do that event to empower the girls. And then when he spoke and said that, I was like, you know what? I should not be embarrassed of my accent. And it was something that, that touched my heart and I embraced my accent. <laughs> There's accents all over this country. Have you ever been to Alabama <laughs> or the Midwest, girl? I know. <laughs> We're California. Yeah. <laughs> it's just an accent. It's yours. It's 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 your signature. Think Own about it. it that way. I embrace it now. Yeah. <laughs> it's your signature. So I'm curious what you ladies think about um, the current political climate, um, and specifically as women of color, black and brown women in the current political climate who are active. Um, share some reflections on the last year, um, on how you have seen black and brown women moving in the political climate nationally and locally. Um, and, you know, just kind of let's, let's, let's talk about where we are and how you're feeling about it and what analyses you have and where you think we're going. And I will let whoever wants to jump in <laughs> to that question jump in first. Well, I'll start. I'll start. Um, I think the 2018 elections really brought a surge to new women to local and statewide offices with notable gains for young women and veterans who were now starting to run for races throughout nationally. There were major breakthroughs for women of color in the House of Representatives and so forth. So, and many of those women who ran in 2018 kind of said they were inspired to do so. And I read this in an article by um, the defeat of Hillary Clinton in 2016. So it kind of gave everybody a push like, no, you know, and, and we saw a woman in that figure, you know, she was the first major political, you know, um, she was endorsed to run for presidency. So um, it, it really made a difference in those years, but I'm really excited and hopeful of what New Jersey is going to look like in the upcoming years. We've been doing this work and being overlooked for a long time. And for me, it's, it's like enough is enough, right? How can we stand here as women and, and watch what's happening as state legislators? You know, we, we're not even half of what the Senate's you know, Senate seats are. We're not even half of the assembly seats. We're just a third. There's 40 state Senate seats. There's only 10 who are women. Uh, assembly, 80 seats, 26 are women. You know, we had some amazing trailblazers here in, in, in the 60s and 70s of black, the first um, black woman who became freeholder in Essex County, which is now commissioner, right? Miss Lipman. And, and then she became in 72, the first senator, black senator, you know, and then Latinas, we had to wait to 2000 and what, I think eight for Senator Reese. They, they, these are issues. These are real issues. And so uh, although I'm very excited, I just want to put it out there. You know, these are issues that we should be having more conversations um, with one another about and how are we going to make the impact and make the change and kind of start bridging that gap. Let's really start working together. And I'll turn it over to my fellow 
um, co-host. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I would I, I would I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry, Ms. Harley, where you going? No, you um, go ahead. Thank you. I just want to say, um, I agree with, um, you know, Sarah. I think, one, I'm excited about a lot that has happened. A lot of women who have, um, you know, one office. I mean, I look at um, Congress and, you know, I'm like, whoa, you know, so excited, feel good. Even some women who've already been um, in politics, but now getting, you know, leadership roles in the cabinet and so forth. I mean, it's been an exciting um, time, but I think, you know, truly we haven't really made like a big dent in the pavement, right? I mean, just listening to the data that Sarah just gave, I mean, but like, you know, you would think, you know, we would have way um, more um, positions and more seats, you know, um, but especially with the way women have come out and voted, you know, as, you know, so at the end of the day, I think we still do have a lot more work to do. I think that, you know, we need to be having more of these conversations, more of really, really, really investing in women's campaigns um, because, you know, it takes money to win these campaigns and, and we need that grassroots as well as the funding um, to make it possible. So I just think we have many more conversations to have, but I'm excited um, in, in, in the current time with, you know, all of the women that are, you know, leading the way and leading the charge and, you know, just out there on the, on those headlines. I feel good. You know, I mean, the moment for Kamala, I mean, I felt like, I mean, it was in the middle of COVID, but I felt like just going out to party, like everywhere, like, you know, on, on a day <laughs> when she, when she took office, it just felt so good i mean you're trying to have virtual parties all over here and there and just have a good time but it was really a proud moment and and it really made me think okay you know we need to like open the doors and really really um go out there and seek some more seats and you know in more leadership positions jackie i'm sorry deputy mayor yeah i want to echo what the girls just mentioned politically i think new jersey is a very progressive state while we, we made some progress um women of color still need to work harder to end the same level of respect as do our male counterparts. I also think we need greater representation in politics. So we gotta continue to work hard and to push the girls and the future generation to run for office. Thank you. Okay. Well, I was gonna say, I think it started, I, Sarah talked about it started you know, in 2018 when we saw real activism by black and brown women that made a difference in particularly in congressional races. Mm -hmm. But I really think we had a wake up call after 2016 because we saw what happened when we stayed home. Mm -hmm. And that is how Donald Trump got elected. And I have some data that I wanna share with you. Just looking in Michigan, because I'm looking at states that went red and now we turned them blue through the activism of black and brown women, organized coalitions of black and brown women. In Michigan, he won Michigan. And these are those electoral college rich states by only 11,000 votes. But just in the black community alone in Detroit, 277,000 black registered voters were AWOL. Hmm. You look at a state like Georgia, he won Georgia by 211,000 votes but a half a million black and brown registered voters didn't show up. So I think that we know that, you know, those who forget their history are destined to repeat it. So we decided in 2018 that we were not going to repeat that history. And you saw real grassroots activism of black and brown women coalescing, coalitioning and coalescing together to turn and flip the house to turn and get people elected that looked like us and cared about the issues. So when we rolled around to 2020, after we saw the betrayal mm -hmm. of Stacey Abrams, I worked on her campaign. I was in Georgia and I saw how hard that sister worked and I saw how hard black and brown women worked, but they were not supported by white women. And that was the margin of difference for Stacey Abrams. We didn't just double down on our efforts to make 2020 go in our favor, we tripled down in our efforts. And you saw all kinds of phone banking and calling and grassroots organizing and getting people out to vote. And we watched those primaries as they unfolded. And we saw states like Iowa where there, where there are so few black and brown people that you wouldn't have expected someone that had our sensibilities to win. And the same thing happened in New Hampshire. And then we came to South Carolina. 
And that is when the moment Jim Clyburn said, we know Joe and Joe knows us, every single organization of black and brown women coalitioned around him and we made it happen. Like I said to another presentation, we put a sister in the White House mm -hmm. and we put a brother from another mother in the White House and it was black and brown women who did it. And we have the big mo, the big momentum, and we've got to keep it going right here in New Jersey. We've got a gubernatorial election that we're going to have to work hard to win. We've got the magnificent, wonderful Sheila Oliver as Lieutenant Governor. And we're gonna have to come out in numbers because this election is not gonna be like it was when they ran again, when they ran the first time. They've got a charismatic Republican candidate and we don't know who he's gonna put on that ticket with him, but I believe it's gonna be a black or brown woman and she may not share our sensibilities. So because Cittarelli is, everybody's talking about how fine he is and how charismatic he is. So we're gonna to have to work even harder to make sure that our values, and I, I know I'm partisan, democratic values stay in the state house and that Sheila Oliver stays there as well. So, so we, as I said earlier, we're the straw that stirs the drink. They can't win without us. So let's show up, show out, and make it happen for us. And so I, I hear this, this, um, this sentiment of hope and excitement, and then this reality check that mm -hmm. I think you just kind of laid out for us, Dr. Harley. And before, again, before when we were in the green room of, mm -hmm. of the Zoom green room and we were chatting it up. Um, you know, you were talking about the numbers of Black women that came out to vote. Um, and then uh, Sarah brought up the lack of representation, right, at the state level and the Assembly and the Senate. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, and this is a very novice question because I'm a very novice politician, so you just have to bear with the question. Um, and just in thinking about the way in which Black women vote and, and Latina women vote, right? Um, we, we vote our interests, but our interests are the interests of sort of universal betterment, right? And we, can, we see that in, in this last election. Is there that, what, what is the barrier? Um, how do we use our voting power to get more of us in these positions? And, and what does that look like from your experience and from your point of view? Um, and even in the short term, right, in the upcoming election cycles, do you see any possibility for, for that to happen at the state level and at the local level, given that that's kind of where we are in election cycles? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we have to let women, black and brown women know that we've got their back, that if they raise their hand and say they want to run, that we will support them. And I'll give you an example. In the 21st district, um, uh, B.B. Taylor, who was the first lady of East Orange, they've moved to another town and the 21st district is open. So she raised her hand and said that she wanted to run and she has you know, three county chairs to get through and all of these municipal chairs to get through. And she was there, she was out there, she was talking to everybody, she's certainly eminently qualified. There's no doubt about that. So what did we do? We put together a letter and we got over 200 women mm -hmm. to sign that letter from all organizations, black and brown women to say, we support B. Taylor. She's, as we said, tailor-made for District 21. And the, the Essex County Federation of Democratic Women also sent out, and this was a combination because it's a, it's a black and brown and, and, and a white women's group, put their letter in. But she has not been able to get the support of those chairs because she's got Union County, Morris County, and I believe Somerset County. You've got three chairs. She is new to the district. But you better believe they're paying attention because when not only did the letters start coming in, but the money started coming in for her campaign. So she might not have made it through this round because it looks like, you know, it, it's not going to happen. But she's also not going to give up because she knows that she's got a tribe that right. supports her and they know it too. And we can do that all over. That's how Bonnie Watson Coleman won. 
when she went to Congress, it's because black and brown women throughout that crazy district came together and supported her big time and in a big way. And the same thing happened for, for a few all of I'll be when she ran for lieutenant governor, I'll be honest with you, we were out there, we were calling people, we were doing the work. And when we were phone banking, what was interesting was people told us they weren't gonna vote for Murphy, but they were gonna vote for Sheila. And we were like, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you can't get her unless you vote for him. And not that they had any animus toward him, they did not know him, but they knew Sheila Oliver. So we've got to make sure that we keep that momentum going that we make our phone calls, that we call on our people, that we showcase. Um, and uh, in this instance, Sheila, Sheila Oliver, she has been steady and ready for a long time and supported our community in ways that are just too big to ignore. So we've got to make sure that people understand that if you want her, you vote for him, even if you feel you don't know him. And she's got to know that we've got her back, no matter who Chitterelli puts on that ticket. That if, because if that person's with him, she can't be with us because he's not with us. Thank you. Um, so to those of you watching, if you want to drop some questions in the Q&A, please not in the chat. There's way too much going on in the chat to follow it. So if you do want to ask the panelists any questions, please put them in the Q&A um, and I will, I will ask them for you. Um, so I'm curious if you might want to share a few of your um, political experiences in the current political environment and, you know, maybe um, sort of thinking pre-2020 and into this transitional phase that we're in, um, just, just what you have personally um, encountered um, successes that you felt you've had, ways in which you've been impacted, and any impact that you think that you've been making uh, in the spaces where you're working. Deputy Mayor, would you like to jump in on this one? Well, I think the last four years were very tough. We were working with an administration that didn't believe in our community, but now I, I consider myself fortunate to work for Mayor Baraka as a Deputy Mayor of the City of North. Um, where I grew up, I was born here as a deputy mayor. I serve as a bridge between the community and the mayor, and he has developed so many programs and projects for those communities. And I'm proud to do to work for the mayor because we continue to move the city forward. And when we move the city forward, the state of New Jersey moves forward. So I'm I'm grateful to be here working with Mayor Rasky Baraka. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I will just briefly say um, I, I've seen, I, I've worked on a lot of political campaigns. I wouldn't say like 20 or anything like that, but for me, you know, working on one is a lot, as you all know, right? Um, so I've worked on a couple of uh, very grassroots organizing, and it has been the best experience for me. I have grown each and every time. I have met some amazing people. Being out there in the community and listening to what are the needs of the people is key, right? And where that with that bridge for the, the candidate and you know what's happening right we have to communicate that so all these different things that i've learned with different races local statewide um i was blessed to serve on the biden harrison policy team and so on a national level so i really take a lot of nuggets from each one um and i, I i've loved it i love strategizing i, I grow every time i don't know it all and it was the, the woman that in a backseat of a black SUV that told me, you stay close to me. And that was a councilwoman Crump. <laughs> and you know, you stay close to me and you just better listen. And you know, she would prep me for like entering a, a Baptist church. <laughs> she thought I never went into one, but you know, that's okay. Cause that's what she does. She's like, listen, I don't want you to get scared. You know, this is how it's done. I was like, don't worry, I got this. But you know, it, it was all those nuggets, right? That you learn along the way. And um, I've just loved it. I, I really think it's important that you get involved and you just volunteer. Even just making a phone call, you know, when I did, banking for Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker, or, you know, whatever you do, it's your part of it. Right. But I think the most important thing, and I'll just 
let my other colleagues speak on it was the fact that you wanted somebody reached out to involve you in the process. A lot of times we don't go, our, we say, oh, our people in the community, in the neighborhood, they don't care about politics. Yes, they do. Did anybody take the time to ask them? Did anybody get take the time? She has three jobs and two kids. Maybe she doesn't have time to, to be out there volunteering, but how about you just go ask her? So I think sometimes we forget that it is communities like those, they vote too but sometimes they're not even asked for their what's happening in their communities or in their lives. So just I'll end on that note, but I'd love that level of um, campaign that you like working on more. Do you like city campaign, state campaign, the Biden Harris campaign? Like where did you feel your most mojo or whatever? I, I really love local. Uh -huh. I really love local. Local politics is key and I love policy. I love, you know, you think that you have to run for office to make a difference. And that was me 20 years ago. I thought I had to run for office, you know, to make a difference in my community, to let my voice be heard. But I learned that, no, I can change policies. I could speak up. I can be myself. And sometimes it's funny, people will say, oh, here comes Sarah. Oh, you know, she's going to keep it real. <laughs> so, you know, people know, okay, here she comes. Don't, don't try to tell me that, you know, this is who I am. This is my authentic self. And I, if you don't want me, don't invite me. I'm good with that too. Um, but it's not always having to be at the front line. And um, I'm blessed to, to work in the back with the, with the team. I love doing that. Councilwoman. Um, so of course, I'm, I'm still in my first term. Everyone knows this is the first term. It feels like it's been 10 terms, but it's literally been one term and it's two and a half years and some change now. And we've been having a good time. I mean, I've been having a good time. My team, I, you know, thankful for my team. Some of them are in watching um, it. So thank, thankful for them. Um, I think for us, it's just been trying to reshape the idea of a council person. Um, you know, trying to do things differently, um, getting out of the habit of what's been done for the last, you know, couple of decades. Uh, we're definitely not doing that. Um, we've been, you know, doing new things, able to be, you know, creative and, and do some new things. And, I, and I've really been enjoying that. Um, this last year, of course, I mean, I never thought running for office, I would be dealing with a global pandemic um, and trying to lead through that. But it's definitely been, you know, difficult through all of that. And, and as Jackie mentioned, Deputy Mayor mentioned, um, I mean, we, we're grateful to have an amazing mayor, um, you know, who literally kind of led us through it all, you know, uh, especially during the time when Trump was in office, that was like a nightmare through this. Um, and to have him, you know, our city was covered, um, you know, and, and so we were, we were really thankful and grateful for that. But, you know, the successes for, for, for me has been the visibility. I think if, if someone had to um, judge my, you know, term, I think the the one thing is to be visible. When I was running for office, there were so many people that was like, girl, get out my face. I ain't voting. I ain't dealing with that. I don't know who the last council person was. I don't care, whatever, whatever. And it was a lot of young people too that was saying that. Um, and for me, I was just like, well, how do you not really know who the last council person was? Like, you really don't know. I mean, to me, I was like kind of heartbreaking um, to hear that. And so when I, when I won, I made it my business to just like go all around the ward to, you know, host these meetings and do meet and greets and just, you know, let people put a face with a name, you know, and have conversation. And so we, we were doing that and doing that all over and we're still doing it now virtually, but just to be visible because it, it was just really, you know, devastating to hear folks say that they didn't know um, the local leadership, you know, in, in, in a city like Newark. And so um, to me, we've been just working hard doing that and doing that. Um, so that's been a success um, for me. I think uh, one of the things that's been a negative and not so much, I don't want to call it a negative, but just something that I'm learning through is one being a woman um, in leadership, you know, uh, especially in a arena, you know, that is filled um, with men. Um, it has been, you know, a challenge. And so I have I always say I have like literally, you know, two handicaps. And so, and I don't call them a handicap literally, but just two things that barrier me, which is, you know, one being a woman, but also being young, um, which is something that you constantly have to fight through, um, through, you know, different rooms, you know, at different tables there, you know, you have to like literally, you know, stand up and, you know, say, no, I'm not to say my word. I'm gonna get my word in too, because my word matters as well. So, you know, that is just something that I'm just trying to puzzle through through. I'm still, you know, learning through it all, but I'm, you know, I'm getting through it. Um, but to me, that has definitely been, you know, an eye opener um, to be able to navigate, you know, through those different rooms and those different tables. 
Thank you. Dr. Harley, I'm curious how you have evolved over your career from the beginning to now. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you learn as you get older and you encounter different things. So I've evolved in to, to this extent. I am much more focused um, than I was. Uh, I was never one to uh, mince my words or um, be quiet about things. Um, and I enjoyed, enjoyed the fight. I enjoyed the battles. But not everything deserves your time and attention. I've learned that. I have become much more um, convinced of the possibilities that are out there for me and my sisters. So my evolution has been, you know, focus on what I really love, do what I love, focus on it, and then take it to the level of success. So the joy I've gotten is through the company I formed, Operation Big Boat LLC, and um, Black women, Latina women who are running for office reach out to me to help me, to help, help me, for me to help them get elected because I really believe in coalitions of women's groups that are committed to community service. And the level of success has been exactly what I wanted. I was in Atlanta with Keisha Lance Bottom. She's a Delta and we got all of the Greek, the Panhellenic Council together, but the women's groups, it didn't work so well with Stacey Abrams because we were betrayed and I shared that with you already. But I met a woman out in San Francisco by the name of London Breed. She was the deputy, she was the president of the city council. The mayor of San Francisco dropped dead in a, a ribbon cutting ceremony. And by their own governing documents, she should have been the acting mayor, but those guys got together, changed the governing documents and cut her out. Mm -hmm. And I knew her through a common friend. And I said, now look at the demographics of San Francisco. He can be the acting mayor all he wants, but if we organize the black women's groups, the Asian women's groups, the Latinx women's groups, you will win. And we did it and she won. Then. I went to work with Ayanna Presley in Massachusetts. Remember she ran, she's the first black woman to ever sit on the Boston City Council. Um, I knew her through her cousin and um, they had a good congressman by all accounts. He was voting the right way, but he never once set foot into the Roxbury community, hmm. never set foot into the housing developments. Why? Because he had the line. He didn't have to because they always voted for him. And I told her, I said, he may be doing a good job, but you'll do a better job because the people know you. And even the Congressional Black Caucus sent people up there to campaign for him, which by implication meant they were campaigning against her. And I'm telling you, Ayanna won so big that come November, the Republicans didn't even run a candidate against her. So it was the Black and Brown Women Coalitions that came out in big numbers for her and she won and the rest is of course history. So that's where I've, how I've evolved because I'm very focused mm -hmm. and I've had some white guys say, look, we, can we hire Operation Big Boat? And I'm very intentional. I only work for black and brown women. And that is how I've evolved. I'm very focused and it's a very narrow but very satisfying focus. And we did it in West Orange first black woman ever elected to the city council, Tammy Williams, same playbook, coalition of black and brown women's groups. And we did one other thing. We educated our community on how you bullet vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have three votes, but when you go in that booth or when you turn in that ballot, only vote for Tammy Williams because it's the top vote getters that win. And of the candidates that ran, the new candidates, she was the top vote getter and she is now a councilwoman in West Orange. And I take great pride in that. Thank you. So we are at 7.15 and I just would like to, you know, give you each the opportunity to share a reflection um, before we close. So we know that uh, we will circle back, but I think that point about being focused and, and not being apologetic about it 
is, is something that I'm going to walk away um, from your last remarks with Dr. Harley, because I feel like sometimes when we do say this is, this is where we are, people try to pull us mm -hmm. um, into different spaces and you have just really validated um, for me that it's okay to say, no, this is, this is my work and this is who I work with. Thank you very much. Okay, and just one other thing that I live by, it's a phrase that I absolutely live by, function in disaster and finish in style. <laughs> well, all right. So let's go with those reflections. Let's finish in style. <laughs> well, I think we should promote each other. We should build each other up because when we build up each other, we create opportunities for women of Black and Brown women. So I think we should support each other, build each other up, and we're going to be able to elect more Black and Latino women in office. Not Thank bring you. each other down, just build each other up. Um, so I would, you know, for, for all of the women, first of all, I just want to thank you, Dr. Wells, again for, um, you know, having us. This was really good. I love when we can, you know, get together like this, especially during a pandemic, virtually in our new virtual space and have these conversations. Um, I think, you know, for all of the women that are watching, I know we're streaming this live on Facebook and, you know, I'm sharing it on my page. I think, you know, if you are a woman, um, it's time to, you know, if you haven't done so already to find your place and your purpose, um, you know, and stick to it, um, you know, remain focused, just like Dr. Harley, um, you know, talked about, you know, finding your focus, finding your place, finding your purpose. Um, and, and get into it. It is definitely, to me, I feel like it's our time. You know, to me, it's always been our time, but it's for real. Like you have the young people say for real, for real, it's for real, for real, our time now. And so, you know, just like um, Deputy Mayor said, you know, if we can, if you can get together, find your purpose, you know, take your position, no matter what position that may be, you know, uh, de define it, um, define your purpose and, and push forward, you know, we're going to be strong, you know, and we're going to learn how to support one another. Um, but first, it starts with us, right? It starts with you, um, you know, it starts with me, myself, but it starts with you, yourself. And so definitely that's what I encourage, you know, women to do, you know, get off the sidelines, you know, put your good heel shoe on or your sneakers, whichever, whichever you prefer to wear, you know, get into position, um, whatever position it may be. It doesn't have to be elected office. It can be, you know, just a leader on your block, you know, a part of your child's PTA team, you running things in the school, whatever it is, you know, find your position and, and your purpose and let's push, let's push forward. Thank you. Um, I'll go next. I think um, I, I love what you said, Councilwoman. It's about finding your your purpose, following your passion. You know, a lot of us still we're like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do next? Or blah blah blah. It's finding that passion that really fuels you. That you're able to get up in the morning and say, I'm getting up, and I love what I'm doing, regardless of what that may be. Um, and just really staying aligned and to Dr. Harley's point of staying focused, you know, write some goals out, do some self-care. I mean, when we talk about women, the politics for women, we know it's a little bit harder. Let's keep it real um, for us as women, because we wear several hats than for men. And for us to make a decision to run for office, we got to run it through the aunt, through the uncle, through everybody and to the girlfriend next door. Meanwhile, men will just wake up and say, I just want to run for office. And they're okay with that. So maybe we need to also be a little more confident that we got what it takes uh, um, the youngest councilwoman in Newark, I'm so proud of you for stepping up when you were called to step up, you know, good for you. And you're making an impact in that community and you're changing things, right? So I, I just, let's look at these, some of these women, these examples. You know, we have um, Brittany Timberlake, Assemblywoman Br Brittany Timberlake making strides, breaking glass ceilings over there. And, and so there's so many great women. So just look at them. And if that if that's your passion and that's what fuels you, just follow it. But do every try to stay focused and do everything that's aligned with it. You know, if something's not aligned, they're asking you to be a board member on this organization that has nothing to do with what you want to do in, next year. You need to say, no, I'm sorry. Maybe, you know, I'll circle back with you. And that's okay. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you, want, you don't want to help your community because you can help in other ways. 
you can volunteer with them or whatever, but be able to be okay with saying, no, that's, you know, because it's not really aligned with your purpose or what you want to do next year. So set some goals, stay focused and just reach out and, and really just make sure you know who's in your circle. You have that close circle and then you got a little bit bigger circle and, and just really reach out to some of these great women who are here on the call today with, with tons of knowledge that can help you get to the next level where you want to get to. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Harley, do you want to have the last word? Just that um, I want to thank you for pulling this together. As I said, this couldn't have happened at a better time. And I echo everything that everyone else has said um, about supporting each other, standing up for each other, and um, getting to know who the other women are who are in this space. I mentioned Tammy Williams in West Orange, and we have um, uh, Wartina Davis over in Bloomfield, who is serving there, and she's the first and only Black woman on her council. So I'm going to ask you and all of us who, who've met on this call today to make sure that we encircle these women. We, we stay with Councilwoman MacGyver and our deputy mayor um, here in Newark and make sure we nurture and grow and be a base of support for these women so that um, when they come after you, that means they're coming after us too and stand our ground and stand with each other. Nothing is better than that. Thank you. And I, and I want to thank all of you ladies for the wisdom that you have shared this evening, for the, the depth and the sincerity, um, and just, you know, for coming into the space and, and feeling comfortable enough to just be open about um, your experiences, you know, share some insecurities and, and just know that, that it's okay because to that point, we all do support each other. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for each one of you um, in, in so many ways. And I thank you for your time this evening. And I just thank you for the service um, and the work that you do for all of us, what is seen and what is unseen, because there is a lot that goes unseen. And sometimes those are the things, that's where it's, the greatest things sometimes happen and where sometimes we're having the greatest impact. So I know that even when we don't see you, that you're out there working um, for the community, um, working for us as Black and Latina women and just working to make sure that we have a future that we deserve. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Wells. Thank you, Dr. Wells. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Stay well. Good, good night. Good night. Bye, everyone.